what every scientist, what every Adventist scientist should know, ice cores. We've been talking about what every Adventist scientist should know, the philosophy of science, is there God, the origin of the universe, the privileged planet, the origin of life, task of unguided evolution and genetic entropy. We're going to have to redo the origin of life, but everything else is done. Um, how old is life on Earth and was there a flood? And there are a number of other subjects in that, uh, 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 under that general heading. And challenges to long, young life creationism, which we are finishing up today with ice cores. And uh, next week we'll talk about Ellen White's health messages and alcohol. And I am deeply indebted to uh, Jeffrey Sonnentag to, uh, for uh, uh, the, as far as I can tell, the very latest on that particular issue. Ice cores. I'm going to give you the references first, uh, then the claim that is made, the cores, the evidence from the cores themselves the data that we have, and finally, my take on it. Um, and then, of course, you get to make comments and ask questions. The references first. Um, the Probably the premier reference, which is, of course, pro-long age, is Richard Alley, 2000, The Two-Mile Time Machine. Very good summary of the work to that date. Um, and probably doesn't need that much updating because what happens when scientists do this kind of thing is they take the first age material and they kind of tend to stick with it and don't ask too many questions after that. Um, then there's a website for the Greenland ice cores themselves. I haven't included anything for the Antarctic ones, and the reason for that will become apparent very shortly. Uh, Larry Vardaman, 1993, Ice Cores in the Age of the Earth. Uh, is one of the better creationist uh, works on the subject. Uh, Michael Ord, 2005, is a little more updated, but again, very brief. Uh, Vardaman goes through the stuff that you want much more deeply. And then Sean Pittman uh, wrote a, an excellent article as well in 2006, um, which is a good synthesis of uh, what's there. Ice cores in time. Um, ice cores are claimed to be a major challenge to short age creationism. And the way they're presented, they are. The cores have layers in them, some of which can be reasonably proved to be yearly. It is claimed that there are over 110,000 layers in some cores in Greenland and over 400,000 layers in Antarctica. If that claim were to held up, any flood would have had to have been before the layers because a flood would have floated the uh, ice core, uh, the uh, ice caps off of Greenland at least and probably off of Antarctica as well. And so there should not be any. Um, those, those layers all have to be after the flood. Well, 400,000 years or even 110,000 years is really pushing it for any kind of biblical chronology. And because it doesn't fit a reasonable biblical chronology, and it does fit the standard geologic time scale, um, it is claimed that uh, we should just roll over and quit and uh, uh, all become long agers. Now, the first thing I'm going to talk about is where the ice cores are taken from. And um, in Greenland, there are several different places. Um, they tended to drill at first where it was easy to get to. And then later on, try to drill where it was least disturbed by weather patterns, human activity, anything like that. Although the, the place is so vast that um, getting away from human activity is very easy. 
uh, getting it away from weather that comes from the outside is much more difficult, and that's why they usually go to the center. Um, and then there are a number of places in Antarctica, and you can uh, you can uh, see here's here's a, a satellite picture of, of Greenland. Um, right here, interestingly, is the very fastest glacier in the world. Uh, it receives approximately 6% of all of the ice um, from the uh, Greenland ice cap. It gets funneled into that area. And uh, it actually uh, moves at the rate of uh, uh, two meters per hour. Now, that's still a glacial pace, but it's a pretty fast glacial pace. Um, and there's a, a photo of uh, Antarctica, again, from the, from the outside. Um, in Greenland, uh, Camp Century was, again, fairly close to the edge, and so was Die 3. Uh, as it's been going on, they've tried to drill into the uh, the center more so that any ice that gets compressed gets squashed outward rather than getting squashed back and therefore confusing what they're drilling. And I guess North Grip is supposed to be the best place to go right now. Um, but the most work has been done on Grip and on GISP too. Grip is Greenland ice uh, core project, and GISP is Greenland Ice Sheet Project. Uh, there are a few other cores uh, around, like the one in Renland as well. And in Antarctica, there are a number of different ones, West Antarctica, the Bird Station, um, and you can see Dome F, Dome B, Vostok, so there are, there are a number of places that one can drill. Um, well, how do you measure those annual layers? Well, the obvious thing to do is measure them visually, right? Okay. You can also do oxygen 18, laser light scattering, which is kind of a, a visual, only using a machine to do the, your vision. Chemical content. Sodium, potassium, calcium, sulfate ion. Conductivity, which usually varies with the acidity of the uh, ice. And of course, you can try to correlate multiple methods. And finally, the best and most reliable way of doing it is historically dated material. Well, visual. <laughs> you look at the ice, whoa, there are layers there. Pretty obvious, right? It'd be nice if these were all um, annual layers, and then you could just simply say, well, you know, count the rings like you would in a tree. And, you know, even if you missed one or two, you'd be pretty close. And early on, the ice cores do, in fact, look that way, you know? Although, you know, it's, let's see, is this a year? Is that a year? Is that a year? Is that a year? What is this light band? Um, Maybe this is uh, just a storm here. You know, at a certain point, you're starting to say, well, I'm not sure. And then if you get down further, you have things like this, which is taken from Allie's book, uh, where the layers are obviously folded. The distance from the bottom to the top there is supposed to be about five feet in real life. So you can see there's a significant amount of folding. What's worse is that if you get down far enough, and this is about 2,000 feet, or not 2,000 feet, 2,000 years, you start losing the rings. You can see this is a photograph of one of the cores, and you can't see anything. And a lot of people think that this is ringed all the way down. Well. It isn't. 
In fact, in Antarctica, it's worse because according to Ali, and remember Ali's a protagonist, so he has no reason to minimize all this stuff. The long ice core records from Antarctica have come mostly from places where the average snowfall that accumulates each year is thinner than the height of a snowdrift, so that the annual layers are not preserved. And that's why I didn't make a big deal about Antarctica, because you're not talking about annual layers. Um, so you measure stuff down and you hope you've got it right and you hope that all of your uh, rings correspond to years, but there are no rings. So from, a, from the point of view of Antarctica, you can't make a really good argument. The only thing you can do is say, well, that's too much snow to have fallen in such a short time. That's the only argument you can really make. In Greenland, uh, it's a little better. There's a core that went down to 1783 AD. And um, there's a volcano in Iceland that erupted at that point, spewed sulfuric acid, little bits of glass, whatever, into the uh, atmosphere, floated around, some of it landed on Greenland. And they found the spike in sulfuric acid, and they later went back and found the little bits of glass, and they chemically, they match what comes out of, or what came out of Lucky. Unfortunately, they were off by five years. Now, it was five years too little. So they went back and they looked at their log again and they said, oops, oh, we missed three years. We still are off by two years. Maybe one because it was 84 by the time the uh, uh, the cloud came over and dumped most of its stuff on, on Greenland, maybe. So they're off by somewhere between one and two years. The thing that I find interesting is that it illustrates the difference between the way this research is carried out and the way research in medicine is carried out. If you're stuck in the middle of Greenland with absolutely nothing else to do besides, I guess, entertain yourself and count cores, and you don't keep an accurate count of the cores, I don't know, if I was a resident, I would be given a very hard time over that, I think. Um, but you know, this is, a, it's a different standard. Uh, there were some other interesting things that have to do with this. Uh, one of them is there are several airplanes that landed on the ice during World War II, down near the south, actually south of the uh, die core that you saw. And um, they were later retrieved. But when they went back to find them, they thought, oh, well, you know, it'll be 12 feet of snow. We'll be able to find them easy. Some of the tails will still be sticking up. And, you know, uh, they weren't. They were something like uh, 260 feet of ice. And they were three miles away. They, they searched for years. They finally wound up, you know, having to use metal detectors and all kinds of stuff. And uh, the person, they melted the snow down to where one of the fighters was and took it apart piece by piece, brought it through the hole in the snow they'd made, and uh, then uh, put it back together and it's on display. Uh, but the people who did that were asked, well, you know, how many layers of snow were there? And they're like, there were many hundreds of layers of ice above the airplane. Now, in the center, we can demonstrate that one layer a year is quite reasonable back to 1700. So what happened? What's the difference between this and the other ones? 
This one is close to the edge of the ice sheet where more snow comes and where storms make more of a difference. So you get a layer with this storm and a layer with that storm and a layer with this storm and a layer with that storm. And that's how you can, in some 25 years, dump hundreds of layers of ice. In fact, you remember that picture? That's actually not a Greenland. That is of a Peruvian glacier. And there are lots of layers there, and they're not necessarily yearly. And the reason that I say that is that although in the center of Greenland, for a certain time, I think you can argue that the layers are where they're supposed to be. Uh, when you lose the layers, it becomes somewhat untrustworthy, and more importantly, Let's supposing that once upon a time in the inside of Greenland there was a beginning ice sheet. Now the center of the ice sheet is actually close enough to the edge of the ice sheet that you could dump multiple uh, layers on in one year. So that the the use of that kind of thing as a proof probably is stretching it just a bit. Well, maybe visual isn't good enough, so let's go to oxygen 18. Oxygen 18 does go back and forth. Um, there's more of it uh, when it's warmer and less of it when it's colder. Uh, this is an illustration from Camp Century um, on the eastern part. You'll notice that as you go down in terms of feet or meters, if you like, um, as you go down, th there is a thin layer at the bottom, which is what, one sixth of it or something like that, where oxygen 18 is rarely, f uh, much more rarely found. And uh, that means that, generally speaking, it's felt to be that this snow is deposited in a colder en or environment or perhaps in evaporated in a colder environment, or both. And so what you're looking at here is a proxy for temperature. Now, that's the usual pattern. Here's the dye three core, and you can see oxygen 18 is uh, wildly varying until you get down to about 1,500 feet, and then all of a sudden, for some reason, it narrows and also has that same curve off to the left. Another one from Renland, which is again near the coast. Same kind of thing. Lots of variation coming down and then suddenly becoming much lower and having a swing way out to the cold region. Um, this is bird station in Antarctica. Interestingly enough, you have the same kind of pattern. You'll notice that it doesn't, get, it doesn't do this kind of jumping off to the side until you're 1,000 feet in. What that means is that in order to get ice ages out of this, you have to expand that bottom layer a great deal. And the way they do that theoretically is they say, well, the bottom layers are gradually getting squashed out. And so ice is flowing. You may not think of ice as being able to flow, but it can. If you put enough pressure on it, especially if it's not too cold, it will flow. Um, it flows at a glacial pace, but it flows. Here's Dome F. Now this one is interesting because here, you only have to go down about 500 meters before you start getting the, um, the effect. Now you're having some things that go back and forth. We're not sure exactly why that is. The conventional wisdom is that this is, um, that this is an ice age here, and that this is uh, between, and then that this is another ice age. Well, maybe there are three ice ages, because maybe this seven right here is an uh, 
is in between as well. Well, is 5a enough to be in between? It depends on how much you believe the theory, how strong that data is. If you're looking at it from a kind of microscopic point of view, you can see that this this is actual real time. We can be pretty comfortable with that. But you can see, you can occasionally get um, something that looks like you should have two years there, whereas in fact that's all one year. Here's the one that where you could, get, could have gotten three years if you're doing oxygen 18. Most of these are pretty good. Some of them aren't. If we don't understand why those ones that aren't are there, it's pretty hard to be absolutely sure that when you get into the lower regions where they're supposed to be squashed further, that we know exactly which ones are years and which ones are not. Same problem, this is uh, at depth. Um, this is uh, 1156 meters. And you can see this goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Are these years? Are these storms? Is the real years this thing? I don't know. I don't think anybody else really knows either. Of course, if you need there to be that many years, you can call each one of these a year. In fact, that's particularly interesting uh, when you find out that it used to be said that the ice cores went down 60,000 years. And then they discovered, no, we sh really should have it further than that. And so now it's 115,000 years, 110,000 years, somewhere in there. Basically, we doubled the number of years just by increasing the sensitivity on our instruments. That's not comforting when people are trying to tell you they have absolute time. Here's another example. This is from GRIP. And you can see the delta 18 oxygen here. Again, which one of these is a, you know, should we take the smooth curve? Should we take the uh, actual data? And if we do take the actual data, where do we draw the line? Here's uh, another one here where oxygen 18, actually this one is used deuterium instead of oxygen 18. But it amounts to the same thing because deuterium is heavier than regular hydrogen. Oxygen 18 is re heavier than regular oxygen 16. So uh, both of them collect in the same places. And you can see that deuterium, um, yeah, is more or less yearly, but you can see that there's some extra stuff even today. And this is where we don't have a lot of storms going over the center of Greenland. That's one of the reasons why the center of Greenland is usually used as the, as the yardstick, is because the, the outsides clearly put down more than one layer per year. The center doesn't. But even the center, if you were to take this stuff and read it blindly, you might very well have two layers per year. Fortunately here, the visual layers dominate. In dye 3, you have the same problem with oxygen 18. You can see that there are trends, and there are small wiggles in between the trends. And the question is, which one of them is really annual, or are neither of them annual, and you're looking at some other pattern. The answer is we don't know. Well, if you have that, maybe we can look at laser light scattering, which is basically a laser shining from the side and illuminating the ice. And you measure how much light gets through and how much light goes back, and you take the ratio of those. Um, and here's some data from laser light scattering. Now. This is at uh, uh, 2,000 meters. And as you can see, these are considered to be yearly. Uh, boy, what you do with that? 
Could you be confident that those are yearly layers? Well, the laser light doesn't seem to be that much help. You could get you know, two or three layers out of this, or if you want to make it unsensitive, you could get one layer out of these two and another layer out of this one. Uh, what are your criteria? Do they, do they match anything else? And how confident can you be that they're years? Well, you can try chemical content. You have the same problem. Here's sodium, calcium, and oxygen 18. And you can see that the uh, stuff that you have here is very, very noisy. So I'm not sure that they're that much help. They do tell you that something happened at about 1,500 meters, where suddenly the calcium and sodium concentrations go up. But I don't think they help you with how long ago it was. Conductivity is related to chemical content and gives you the same kind of numbers. And I think conductivity is actually the one that was used to give you, to jump from 60,000 years to 115,000 years. Well, can you correlate multiple methods? If the methods themselves are not reliable, it's pretty hard to get a signal, a reliable signal out of multiple ones. Maybe so. But if you did get a signal, would you be confident that it was in fact age? Here's the uh, Vostok core and you can see they have deuterium, they have CO2, they have methane, they have um, car, uh, oxygen 18, they have something called ice volume, which is a bit interesting, how much is being deposited per year. And of course, that means that you have to know what the years are. Um, and then they have the amount of dust in it and the amount of sodium. This is, I think, the sodium and that's the dust. And yes, there's some correlation between them. Um, I'm not sure I can put time in with all of that. Well, what about historically dated material? That's most reliable. We talked about Lackey and it wasn't too bad. And in fact, I think you can find Vesuvius in the material. But the, th the thing that I thought was striking, and this is Richard Alley, again, the uh, proponent of this stuff, there are no events older than about 2,000 years that are both reliably dated by historical records and have left a clear signal in the ice cores. That means you can be pretty sure of 2,000 years because you can date it with other things that are pretty much unquestionably dated. After that, you're stuck. And you have to take it you know, on faith that each layer was the same and that the compression model that you have is the correct one. Well, of interest, if you have a flood model, you would expect more rain immediately after a flood than you would in the subsequent centuries. And possibly a lot more uh, rain because one of the things that the flood should have done was raise the temperature of the oceans. And so the surface temperature of the ocean being high and the land being cooler, you would expect water to evaporate from the oceans and then dump itself on the land which may be how an ice age could start. Now, I think that if you start knowing that there must be time and how much time there must be, and therefore probably annual layers, you can, you can make yourself believe that there are annual layers. Um, you know, it fits. Why not take it? Why are we fighting this? On the other hand, I think the layers are less convincing with one who does not start with those assumptions.
And I am particularly disturbed by the raising of the number of layers in Greenland from 60,000 to 110,000 years. That seems to me to say that the layers are at least partly subjective, and it raises the question of whether they're all subjective. I, uh, I think that early on the layers are probably better preserved and therefore probably more reliable. Um, I found it of interest that Thera has been disputed both in its standard dating and in its position in the ice cores. And if the ice cores are not really secure, obviously what you do with Thera uh, allows you to count more or less layers between there and um, the gold standard, which I think would probably be uh, something like Vesuvius. Uh, Tambora and um, and Krakatoa also make their appearances, but it's much harder to detect them because they're a lot farther away from Greenland than the Lackey volcano in Iceland was. So I guess I would say that ice cores are still somewhat of a problem because we haven't solved all of the, um, all of the problems we can. But I don't think that they're a big enough problem for us to say, let's just forget about it. Um, we need to dump our theory. Um, those of you who've been here long enough may remember that uh, one of our uh, people here felt that I had not treated ice cores fairly enough. So um, or had not dealt with ice cores. And uh, so I gave him a chance to make a presentation. If you go back far enough, you'll find that presentation. And I think that it's probably still fair to say that from his perspective, it's still true that there are no securely dated things that we can also find in the record. And uh, one of the problems with theory is where do you date it? And that gets into how reliable carbon-14 dating is, how reliable historical dating is, and um, whether we can make sense of all of that stuff. Um, it turns out to be that a lot of this is all of one piece that one of the mistakes that I think we can make is try to attack these one at a time without realizing that there is a certain interconnection. Um, that when, when people can find a connection, then if there's adjustment that can be made, they'll make it so that the two of them are exactly the same. When you do that, it's a good scientific procedure if, you, if all you're trying to do is find out you know, how old something is. However, if the second procedure that you match it against is off, you're going to deliberately match it wrong. I think that's a problem with amino acid dating, too. Um, people tried to match it to carbon-14 dating. And if carbon-14 dating doesn't um, work very well, then amino acid dating is not going to work very well either. Um, anyway, I guess my final take-home message is that I don't see ice cores as an insuperable object to uh, a young chronology for life on Earth. But that's my take. Now it's your turn. Go ahead. Uh, just going to uh, add to, to the picture here. I, uh, 
uh, I thought this was a real serious problem from the way it was presented to me at first. Uh, and when I looked into it, I saw that it uh, really was uh, based on assumptions and particularly for Antarctica. They got into the Milankovitch cycles to try and explain the, these major trends you showed there uh, over 400,000 years. Uh, to try and authenticate it, Milankovitch cycles are subject to a lot of reinterpretation based on other data. Uh, you find that it's, you have to base, well, you have to have one assumption based on another assumption based on another assumption. Uh, so that the, the case uh, does seem quite weak. Uh, one of the things that uh, I was quite impressed with in uh, Ord's book, and y you can find reference to this in my uh, web page, uh, under one of the discussions where I talk about the long ages question. Uh, he points out there that uh, in counting these lower layers in Greenland. And uh, we need to point out that the thickness of the ice in Greenland is, is thin compared to what you expect for 110,000 years. Extremely thin. And the layers are much closer together, supposedly. You get lower down, and then they think some of them have traveled laterally. Uh, to, to try and get this 110,000 uh, years in there, uh, but. It, so that uh, there's that problem that uh, you're not dealing with straight direct data as you go down. There's a lot of transport down there in the bottom. And, uh, but uh, Ord, Ord mentions this rather interesting situation where they, uh, they're counting using the laser, laser beam refraction. Uh, and uh, by narrowing the laser beam down, they were able to add 25,000 years to the uh, Greenland ice cores. And you saw how irregular some of these uh, uh, laser beam uh, peaks were and so on. You can reinterpret it. Uh, and the, the point is that uh, you narrow your beam down, you're going to be get re finer resolution. You get finer resolution, you can count more layers. And, and if you keep narrowing it down more and more, you get down to individual dust particles, which is what a laser beam affects, is affected by. You, you, you really get a lot, but are these significant? Well, when you can add 25,000, just by narrowing the beam, uh, you adjust the thickness of your layers by doing that, of course. Uh, you're in a very subjective area. Uh, and uh, it's something that is not, uh, it's not impressive when you study it. So my, my, uh, my uh, advice to you, if this bothers you, st go study the literature. Uh, you, you really find that it's not what journalists purport it, purport it to be. It's not what those who are trying to uh, evaluate the Bible Purport it to be. Uh, it's uh, it's really a, a lot of assumptions based on other assumptions. It's okay if you believe in long ages, you'll probably be able to say, well, yeah, it, it works okay. But uh, it, it's not something that'll convince the unbeliever. And by the unbeliever, I mean the one who. Uh, does not believe in the standard geologic time scale. Does not believe in the standard time scale. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's comfort for those. It may, there's a little bit of comfort here for those. But beyond that, uh, I was very uh, surprised uh, because I'd heard so much about how serious this problem was uh, to find uh, uh, it really is uh, something that's subject to a lot of reinterpretation. I've read about ice ages and seen maps showing a great part of the earth covered by ice. Certainly the weather must have been different in those periods of time so that there could hardly be a standard of 
springs that you could go by. Well, it's one, of, one of the mysteries is how, you, how do you get that much ice to begin with? And the, the problem is very simple. You have to have it cold enough in the summer so that the ice doesn't melt, or at least not enough of it melts. You have to have it warm enough in the winter so that it can snow. Um, one of the problems is that uh, it's hard to get enough moisture into the air when it's cold to, to dump a lot of a lot of snow. And I think that Ord has made a point that I think is very good, and that is that um, in order to do this, what you really need is you need warmth in the oceans to evaporate the water and then uh, coolness over the land to, uh, uh, to have it uh, drop its precipitation. In fact, you could even argue, I think, successfully that a flood with warming of the global waters uh, may be the best e explanation for how you start an ice age rather than something like a Milankovitch cycle. Mm -hmm. Because some of these, uh, I mean, the Greenland ice sheet itself is, uh, what, a couple of miles, de depending on where you are? And uh, Antarctica is uh, a little bit thicker. Uh, so you're talking about a huge amount of ice. And over the continents, there, are, there were huge ice sheets that were comparable and perhaps even higher, you know, stack two or three miles. In order for the ice to flow outward, you have to have the center that big. And uh, some of those places that it sat on were very close to sea level. So you're looking at you're looking at huge amounts of ice, and how do you get that much ice up? You know, um, as you probably know, if you put ice under pressure, it melts. So you have to have it a cold enough to where it won't melt under pressure, and. Um, uh, there are, there are a lot of things you have to have in order to, in order to make this work. And uh, you have to be dumping ice on it fast enough to where the ice is up there more than it, than it uh, is melting at the sides. Because otherwise you can't get a three mile high pile of ice. Um, and as you, you, know, you look at Greenland today, it's not depositing all that much in the center. Um, that's a problem for both sides. But I think that one side could reasonably say that all of this ice was uh, dumped there because, because the water was evaporated out of warmer areas and then cooled down. Uh, for what it's worth, the most of the cooling takes place when the ice forms <laughs> itself. The uh, the drop in temperature from uh, let's say 10 degrees centigrade to zero is trivial compared with the amount of uh, heat that you lose or that you have to get rid of when you're actually freezing the ice. Um, the other thing that's interesting in the, is that back when I first learned about this stuff, it was pretty comfortably asserted that there were four ice ages. Uh, now, it's been acknowledged that advances and retreats could do the same kind of thing, mm -hmm. that uh, some layers in the ice could do the same general kind of thing. And perhaps more importantly, now they want 30 ice ages, mm -hmm. 33, something like that. Yeah, it's, it's above 30. Uh, the Milankovitch cycles, why do they need that? Because otherwise they can't explain why the ice formed uh, at all. 
And the Milankovitch cycles are basically the, the uh, poles going upright versus the poles leaning in towards the sun. And so the, the proposition is, is made that, that the, the Earth mm -hmm. wobbled. Now, an even stranger thing is, let's extrapolate that backwards. Presumably, this, the, uh, the Earth's wobble would have kept on going backwards through the uh, Miocene, through the Eocene, through the Paleocene. Uh, we do see some things that can be interpreted as ice gouges, although they could also be landslides. Um, in, um, in the late Precambrian, and some people have said, oh, the Earth was a snowball at that point. But you don't see it throughout almost mm -hmm. all of the geological record until just recently. Why is our era so much different from all the other eras in history if you buy the, re the record? Why didn't the dinosaurs have a bunch of ice ages that finally wiped them out? Mm -hmm. Uh, I might add uh, this question of identification of ice ages and of glacial activity is uh, not as objective as we'd like. Uh, in my book Origins, I think I list there at least 12 examples, at least I give reference to them in the uh, references of uh, deposits that have been considered to be represented by ice which are no longer considered that way. Uh, one person's debris flows another person's uh, glacial till. It's not always easy to tell that from one to the other. And so uh, there's a lot of talk about permanent glaciation, other glaciations in the fossil record now and so on. Uh, look at that carefully. Uh, before you uh, draw conclusions regarding that because uh, you're not seeing the ice there. You're seeing supposedly uh, ice deposits, but uh, you can easily deposit by uh, water deposits that look like glacial ice. Now, you, uh, where you find uh, some striations, you may say that's due to ice. Well, this can be also due to earthquakes and faults and so on. That, uh, and uh, there was a case in North Carolina. They, they discovered uh, glaciation in North Carolina. It was published in the Journal of Science, incidentally. They had these striations in, in uh, North Carolina. But th this is, you know, a little far south for, for glacial activity. And well, it came out of Restudy the area that uh, they had uh, lines that looked like gouge lines from ice moving and so on. Uh, this was caused by logging cables, uh, steel cables logging had made these uh, lines on the rocks, and some geologists came around there and interpreted them as uh, glaciation. So be careful. Um, any uh, any comment about the correlation between, this may be a bit off topic, but correlation between uh, CO2 and uh, temperatures in the, in the ice core. Uh, I would uh, just point out that uh, by comparing the graph, it, it appears as though a um, increase in CO2 of about 100 parts per million uh, is, seems to be fairly strongly correlated with an increase of temperature of 10 degrees centigrade. Um, except for the current time in which uh, anthropogenic uh, CO2 has increased at yet another 100 parts per million, but we haven't had the concomitant um, 10 degrees C. Um, I'm, I'm careful about those, uh, those kinds of correlations. Um, as, as is probably evident, if if you believe in a short age, uh, it's a little more difficult to make 
for completely separate ice ages where it builds up and collapses and builds up and collapses. Um, and so if I see CO2 and, uh, uh, and temperature correlated, um, you're not actually seeing temperature correlated. That's the first, that's the number one thing. What you're actually seeing is somebody extrapolating from delta 18 oxygen to temperature. And that is not a straightforward extrapolation. Um, what, what will often happen is that people will pile, well, they, here's a theory, and if you, and if you do this, then, then uh, 18 oxygen is a good proxy for temperature. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. If it isn't, then all of the conclusions about temperature uh, and CO2 are off by whatever that correlation fails. And, you know, that gets into the old hide the decline thing, uh, where um, up to a certain point, tree ring widths in certain uh, pines were I think it's bristlecone, uh, were correlated with global temperature. And then in 1967 or so, the pines started going back to normal and the temperature kept on rising. And what that means is if the temperature is high, you won't necessarily see it in the pines. I mean, that's just obvious from the, from the data. But, you see, if you do that, then you can't go back here and say, well, there never was a warm time because the, the uh, pines didn't show it. So here's a place where people have tried to take pine width and turn it into temperature, and it didn't work. So if you're taking oxygen 18 and turning it into temperature, it also may not work. Um, it's of interest that if you compare oxygen 18 and temperature uh, now, which you can do, that there's a little bit of a correlation, but not as much as you might think. One of the things I wanted to show but had difficulty making the uh, um, uh, making the Photoshop put the two graphs together so you could see it. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting, but if you look at, if you look at Richard uh, Alley's book, you can see where he tries to correlate it and uh, it kind of works, but not as well as you'd like it to. So one of, the, one of the things you'll see is that people correlate A with B, correlate B with C, correlate C with D, and assume that A correlates with D, forgetting that there's a fudge factor in each one of those, and eventually you get to where the, the correlations are extremely poor. And correlation isn't causation, and causation can be you know, you don't know what direction the cause is. That's goes. exactly right. Maybe when it gets cool, it kind of drives carbon dioxide in the atmosphere down for some reason. Or and in fact, if you find the carbon dioxide coming before the cool, uh, then, then it makes it ar more arguable that the carbon dioxide caused the cooling. Um, on the other or, or the lack of carbon dioxide caused the cooling. Whereas if you see the, if you see the cooling, coming before the carbon dioxide, then it raises the question as whether carbon dioxide is mostly being driven by that, and that it's an effect rather than a cause. Um, but there are so many variables in there that I'm, I'm not sure I would draw uh, good conclusions. I'm much more comfortable saying, what is the temperature doing today, now, and extrapolating it and seeing you know, what we can expect in the future and seeing A, whether carbon dioxide correlates, and B, whether there are other variables. 
the, the arguments that go back a ways, they are so full of extrapolations that unless you have good historical records, I'm not sure I, I'm not sure I trust them. Are Just a minute. Proponent? You, you gotta oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Are you a big proponent of the asteroid that was supposed to hit the Yucatan Peninsula and turn into a nuclear winter, which therefore cooled things at that point? Um, I'm a half good proponent for that. I think that there's an asteroid, I think it hit the Yucatan Peninsula, I think it hit it probably near the end of the Mesozoic. Whether it's exactly at the end of the Mesozoic, it depends on how you define Mesozoic for one thing. My understanding is that there are a few dinosaurs who survived afterwards for conventional dating a few hundred thousand years, maybe a million years, but uh, but it didn't, uh, so it didn't cause extinction immediately, if that's how you're looking at it. On the other hand, if you put that in a flood, uh, you would put this at the end of when the dinosaurs were being buried. And so, I think during the flood, a whole lot of things happened. We got hit there. We got hit in Chesapeake Bay. We probably got hit outside of Madagascar. There's a, an area there that looks like it's probably a, a giant, puts all the other ones to shame, really, uh, meteor crater. Um, there's a number of other asteroids that probably hit us. Now, whether that caused the flood or whether that was just part of it, I don't know. But, uh, but I, I, it, it certainly looks like that was uh, at least part of the flood. So they all happened about the same time? Mm, maybe a you know, couple months apart or something. Yeah. It depends on how you want to call it the same time. But I, I don't see how you can get away from that if you have a flood model. Perhaps uh, wiser heads can tell me differently. Uh, this is one of the models you consider. We have to, uh, we look at the asteroid belt and wonder what happened there. Was there some other planet involved uh, in association with the flood? This is pure speculative material, keep that in mind. Uh, but, uh, you have these major extinctions in the fossil record as you go up and some try and relate these with possibly, not strongly, but suggest at least that these may have been due, due to some asteroid phenomena that killed off so many of these organisms at certain levels in the fossil record. We got about six or seven of these as you go up through the fossil record. Uh, they may be asteroid related. This is. Just a suggestion. I'm just wondering, why should we worry about asteroids? If we believe there was a flood and Jesus attested to that fact and we rely on what Jesus said, then why can't we conclude as Adventist that the flood destroyed the dinosaurs instead of asteroids. For me, the, the idea that asteroids might have done this unless, like you said, maybe the asteroids are connected with the flood. But otherwise, I wouldn't worry about that. As an Adventist, of yeah. course, as a scientist, you know, you have to consider all alternatives. But as an Adventist, I don't give it very much value. Well, let, let's supposing that an asteroid impact started plate tectonics, started uh, a, a near pass of a large asteroid, um, pulled uh, water up in the ocean and suddenly allowed it to slosh back on the land and and uh, and have a major uh, flooding effect. If that's the case, God is perfectly capable 
of 120 years before saying this is enough, uh, arranging for the appropriate asteroid to start heading towards the Earth and telling Noah, you got 120 years to work on it. Build yourself a boat, make it big enough for anybody who wants to get in it, tell them all about it. It's just a little different from the movie lately. Um, and, uh, you know, anybody that wants to can come in. Well, thank you very much. That makes uh, a lot of sense. And maybe the asteroids were the major. Maybe they were just an accompanying thing. If you have a big enough uh, planetoid to come in and draw all that water up, then maybe, you know, it had a couple of moons by it and two or three of them get, you know, whacked into the Earth. Uh, or, you know, fellow travelers of some kind. There may have been some other debris that came with it. And so we got missed by the main body, but we got hit by, you know, several, like, mile-wide stuff. Well, that's why I asked about the same time, because most of us think of it, it's all happening in 40 days. And did they all come within 40 days of each other, or 40 years, or 400 years? Or well, the full flood was more like 150 days at least going up and then settling down it took another 150 days I'm not sure exactly what all that means um, but that 150 days is about half a year so you know we may have had several passes by uh, a large body um, the problem is right now we don't have a good model that is specific enough to say, and this is what would happen here, and this is what would happen here, and uh, adjust it to the parameters that we have today so that we can, we can explain everything. We are in the range of general explanations. Now, before anybody says that's stupid and, you know, creation scientist is no good, ask everybody how the moon formed and see how the standard models do. The best, supposedly, standard model right now is that a Mars-sized body hit the Earth some four billion years ago and knocked out the Earth as a part of it. Some of the Mars-sized body missed into the, uh, the Earth. Some of it went into the Moon. That's why the Moon and the Earth have slightly different chemistries, even though they're fairly similar. Um, but the Mars-sized body has to hit it at just the right angle to, to knock out enough moon stuff to collect to become a moon. Uh, do they know what angle? Do they know exactly when? Do they know how it happened so that the moon didn't break up by tidal force before it ever g got orbiting? No. So everybody's in the same boat on that kind of modeling. You know, you will read in the old geologic literature about mountains that raised up and then went back down again and deposited marine material on them and then raised back up and did this three or four times. Do they have any clue as to how that worked? Could you spend some time on Sabbath, perhaps speaking on uh, the effects of Mount Pinatubo eruptions in the Philippines? The effect of Mount Pinatubo? Right. Uh, how did you pronounce it? How did you pronounce it? Because I may be doing it wrong. I, we've always <laughs> heard Pinatubo. But Pinatubo, right. Is that sounds yeah, a little okay. different. But anyways, I, I saw, I, I was there 30 years ago, I went by and man, and we know that there has been a global effect of the eruption. So I think it would be interesting to uh, spend some time on the modern phenomenon, you know, and how it affected the world. It's something in this and, and how it compares with with, uh, yeah. with with the eruptions around the flood. Uh, that would be an interesting discussion, volcanism and the flood. And uh, using Mount Pinatubo as one and, 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 and Mount St. Helens and Mount... Yeah. Uh, uh, Krakatoa and uh, and Tambora, and and uh, you know ask what happens and how many of those mountains had to be erupted near the time of the flood, 
you know, Mount Mazama, which is after the flood, uh, what would that do to a climate? Right. What would it do to the climate? Yeah. No, I, I think it's important. Uh, do you want to give the mic? Yeah. Um, quarter of the sediments are volcanic origin. So it's an important question. Sure. I wish to spend a little bit more time on uh, the folk from Tennessee who found those plains. And they were all standing. Some people says no, they tilted and they sank. It's not. It, those, they those were, they were, were they were sitting, sitting they were sitting in, in the position in which right. they landed and 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 the snow fell and, and covered them and covered them and there are so many layers afterwards you know it's what 45 50 years yeah ago. well yeah. see this is the thing the excuse that is made and it's a valid excuse for now and it's why I believe that they have dis uh, discovered stuff from Mount Vesuvius in the proper place. Uh, within a few years, uh, it would be interesting to see exactly when, because I'd like to know how accurate they are after they fixed the problem at Lackey. Uh, but, but they found something in the approximate place. They also found lead starting then, which was about the time that the uh, Romans really started smelting lead. Before then, there was no reason to get lead into the atmosphere. And when the R Roman Empire collapsed, the lead level goes down. Interesting, um, but uh, the reason that they say that this didn't matter is because, well, this is at the edge of the sheet, you see, where storms do dump more snow. When you get to the inside, the snow is pretty much all dumped by the time, uh, and so you get very little snow in the very center. In fact, most of what's there is actually kind of blown in. Although you do you get some some uh, some storms, but not apparently they uh, the the storms are infrequent enough and and stay frozen enough and uh, to where you start getting annual layers and the, they can be counted. Well, the problem, of course, is that if if that happens at the edge of a sheet, when the sheet begins, the center is also the edge. And so you could conceivably get a whole bunch of snow dumped in the middle to begin with, way more than you would normally expect. And then as time goes on, it goes down. And so you have the layers built up rather thickly at the beginning. And then as things go on, they build up more slowly. So you can't extrapolate from today to when those layers started. I think that's. That's the important part of that message. Um, and there's no question. Everybody admits, including Richard Alley, that there are way more layers than there were years covering those airplanes. Yeah. Well, you see, but you go to Colorado, and they have this underground storage area. You probably heard about. They got this ice core at the expense of the taxpayer to prove that the world is much older than the creation is said. They have a huge ice core in there. They have it uh, sub-zero temperature that they're saving. Yeah, I, apparently you can visit it. And there were a number of people who did, uh, including uh, Tim Standish. There was a, we had a Bible conference in that general area, uh, or not, a geoscience concert in that general area. And uh, afterwards, a number of people who had the ability to stay, uh, stayed for uh, uh, to, to tour the facility. You know, looking back on it, that was years ago when I didn't think I would be asked those kinds of questions and I was busy looking at other stuff and I, you know, I neglected my practice long enough to <laughs> where I should get back to it. Um, so I didn't stay for the extra, I think it was two days. And now I wish I had. We have a bike back there. Uh, just a minute. Uh, here, here. Oh, yeah, for those of you who um, know there's a, an invitation, and I'm pretty sure it's an open invitation, although um, obviously the people who are organizing it would rather uh, have uh, somebody uh, 
uh, let them know that they're coming. Uh, it's July 19. It's 1.30, and it's at uh, Gary and uh, Jackie Bottomer's house. And we're very much appreciative of uh, your offering your, your place for us. Um, and that's... Uh, Yes, that's right. It is. It's next Sabbath, so um, don't forget that. Uh, plan on it, and uh, those of you who can make it, we'll see you there. Uh, my understanding, if you take a look at the uh, topographical map of Greenland, if you remove the snow, that the center of Greenland is actually below sea level. Sort that of is a correct. Horse horseshoe-shaped thing, um, and supposedly that. It's under sea level because the weight of the the ice cap there is is pushing down on it in in pushing you know getting it below sea sea level is that true and if it is then perhaps the, the um, perhaps the the height of the center of of Greenland was higher than when it first started forming the the ice cap. Uh, that's in all probability the case. I I, no, I don't think you'll have too many people that'll argue with that. Um, the, the earth actually bulges very slightly every time the tide comes in. Now the tide, the, the oceans bulge even more because they're not restricted. So that the tide actually goes up, but the earth itself moves slightly. And uh, I mean that's true for the earth whenever, whenever you have a big load, everything kind of sinks down just a little bit and, uh, and whenever you have a uh, lighten the load it comes up. That is probably why the south slope of the Grand Canyon slopes away from the edge. Even though if you look at it, it looks like stuff is poured over the side of it. That wouldn't be, uh, that's tidal? That wouldn't be uplift from lateral compression? Well, you take all of this material out from the Grand Canyon. Oh. And, and the whole thing just lifts up a little bit. Interesting. Um, there's something else that's going to ask. Um, slipped my mind. Isostatic rebound, or isostatic adjustments. This happens all the time. You, uh, Sweden uh, is rising because of the removal of the ice. And uh, it's normal like to you take a weight off it comes up just uh, just uh, imagine imagine a mattress and you pile books on it the mattress will sink underneath the books uh, the earth isn't as soft as a mattress but you know if you take miles and miles of lateral extent it eventually behaves a little bit like that get into the Grand Canyon uh, <coughs> which where you were at not too long ago, the, uh, the great denudation, which are the two miles above the Kaibab sediments, when that was removed, may be responsible for the uplift of the Grand Canyon Plateau itself. And the river cut on down through it as it was rising. One speculative model. Interesting. Um, what about the uh, ocean level rise? I understand that it that uh, it has been fairly consistent, um, not not changing like global surface temperatures, but just continuing the the gauges, the tidal gauges, sort of keep going up over the last I don't know 150 years. Um, do you know Do you know about that? And do you know might it be caused by the loss of of ice from from the sheets on Greenland or and or Iceland? Well, Iceland is too small to have sheets that matter too much. Greenland, if you were to take that whole thing, um, it's supposed to contribute, I think, something like nine meters to the height of the ocean, if you were to melt the whole thing off. Now, it would probably not quite, uh, well, it would probably do that, because th the center of Greenland would probably then rise too close to sea level, and and all the, and you wouldn't have water on top of Greenland either. Um, Antarctica would make a whole lot more difference. 
If you take all of the other glaciers in the world and melted them, the estimate is that it would contribute 1% of what uh, Greenland and Iceland do. Just to uh, you know, give you some kind of scale. Um, massive ice. Uh, if there was an ice age, and I think there was, um, then that would mean that you have piles of ice on top of North America, uh, especially Canada, but also the United States, especially the northern United States. And you'd have piles of ice on top of uh, Sweden, Norway, um, northern Russia, a little bit of Finland. Uh, it, it actually goes quite a ways down. I think the Baltic Sea is supposed to have been involved. Yeah, um, That would have taken a lot of water to do that. And in fact, if you look, uh, there are caves where the entrance is way underwater now, uh, where people have been and have d done things like paint various kinds of animals sometimes in striking detail. These are supposed to be very primitive people back then. Um, their, their artwork certainly doesn't look too primitive. Um, but, you know, you can see where these people have, you know, uh, drawn all kinds of things, including apparently signatures. They uh, uh, didn't have any other way of doing it, so they just put their hand up and would blow uh, basically spray paint, except that they were blowing it instead of spraying it, uh, and leave, you know, outlines of the hand. Uh, very interesting, and, and many of them the same hand, as if the guys, you know, I was here. I guess what you do before you can put your name. Um, and it's, it's kind of interesting because many of those, you know, cave entrances are like hundreds of feet below the water now. Which means it must have been dry enough at least to swim under, if not just flat out to walk. You may want to complicate that with uh, tectonic adjustments also. Well, yeah, there's tectonic adjustments too, but I think that there's, there's enough of it widespread enough that it strongly suggests the water level was at one time quite a bit lower than it is now. Um, related question: uh, uh, Is there has there been any discussion about the uh, amount of time it would take for uh, ice sheets across Canada and in northern part of the United States to to melt? In other words, how how long did the ice age last from from a uh, flood perspective? From a flood perspective, the best estimate I've seen, you know, by people who've tried to study that. Um, and I don't have all the math behind that, so I can't say how good they are. But uh, so you know, take all of what I'm saying with a grain of salt. It's like a couple of hundred years. And, and is that enough time to melt uh, ice sheets miles thick? Probably. It depends on how the climate is. Otherwise, one of the things to keep in mind is that. Um, if you go back far enough, you'll notice that there's an awful lot of volcanoes going on. And uh, when, uh, for example, Mount Mazama blew the entire top of the mountain off, left a big crater in which Crater Lake now sits. Um, that's just one example. There are probably hundreds of those, maybe thousands uh, of of major volcanoes that have gone off during that particular period of time. And if you, um, uh, you know, what you have to realize is that when Tambora went off and, you know, we were there to watch it, or at least our parents and grandparents were, um, they actually measured a drop in the temperature worldwide for two or three years after that went off of something like a degree or so. I mean, it makes global warming look like peanuts when those things go off. 
if they're big enough or there are enough of them. Uh, what happens is that this stuff puts out both sulfate, which apparently reflects uh, a certain, um, uh, certain types of uh, light, and particulate matter, which does the same thing. Uh, and just, you know, I mean, if you look at, if you look at aerial photos of uh, Mount St. Helens, and that was one of the smaller ones, and, you know, Mount Pinatubo was bigger than that by a good share. Um, you have all of this, uh, this huge cloud covered over Washington State, went into Idaho, went into Eastern Oregon, uh, and that was just what you could see from a satellite photo. So uh, there's a lot of reflection that happens with those things. So that would cool things. That cools them. But what about uh, being able to melt something like 50 feet per year? Uh, well, if you suddenly let the sun's rays through, the cooling, it takes a lot of cooling to make that work. And in fact, uh, if um, uh, melting is probably the easier of the two to do. Um, there's a lot that we don't fully understand. Even from a standard perspective, there's the Younger Dryas, which is supposed to have gone from melting to sudden cooling to sudden melting and all that within uh, a dozen years or so. Uh, maybe 50 to 100. I, I'd have to look up the exact numbers, but the Younger Dryas is a, a very rapid climate change. I'm not saying we understand all of it, but I am saying that uh, whether we understand it or not, it can happen. And the first part of science is understanding what happened, then the second part is understanding why. And if you don't get the first part right, the second part won't help you much. Well, we'll uh, see uh, those of you who can next week and um, be prepared for a potluck uh, afterwards. And, uh